Hello, everybody. I'm very happy to be here. I gotta say, I'm slightly nervous, though. In fact, I have an announcement to make. It's a bit embarrassing, but I'm gonna go for it, if you're okay with it. <clears throat> I am in love. Thank you. Uh, I'm in love with a mollusk. Uh, don't worry, not just a generic mollusk. No, I have something in my heart for cephalopods. Cephalopods are a group of animals including squids, cuttlefish, and octopuses. And to me, those are not just, you know, the most alien-like intelligent life form on planet Earth. Well, they also have a superpower. In fact, cephalopods are masters of camouflage. There is an octopus right here in this video, if you can try to spot it. And the way to achieve this trick, well, to me, it is the most inspiring, unique, mind-blowing, and the most inspiring way possible. But before we dig deeper into how to achieve this trick, let's rewind a few years back to my first experience with a cephalopod. It was 2016 in the south of France, and there I met Callistoctopus macropus. It was sunset. I saw the animal, the animal saw me. I remember I was astonished by how fast the animal could change color and shape. After a few dives, up and down, the animal became less shy and more curious. It grabbed my arm. It stayed there for a bit. We stared at each other very intensely. I felt a weird connection, I gotta say almost romantic. So, you know, I did what everybody would do in this situation, obviously. I kissed the octopus. Today I have regrets. <clears throat> of course, because I should not have done that. Just like in human culture, in octopus culture, kissing without consent is considered quite a dick move. So, yeah, my first experience with a cephalopod can really be summarized as a crossover between my octopus teacher and Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> and since then, my love for cephalopod never really stopped. Of course, I do not kiss them anymore, but two very important aspects of my life are now dedicated to them. My research PhD project. So what is so special about cephalopods, you are going to ask me, for me to fall in love with them? Well, to this question, I usually answer that cephalopods have complex brain and behavior. They have camera-type eyes and a closed cardiovascular system, which is not that exceptional when you think about it, because we humans, we all have those features. Well, maybe my uncle Jim doesn't have a very complex brain, and he's also missing an eye. But you get the point. The thing is that if you look at a tree of life, cephalopods and us, well, we're not that closely related. Our last common ancestor lived 600 million years ago, a very long time ago and probably did not have all those complex features. Our lineages split when protostomia and deuterostomia diverged. The difference between the two is that during embryonic development, the first cavity that is created will, in one case, become the mouth. In the other case, the anus. The latter case is our case, so yes, yes. <laughs> Choose a very specific moment in your development where all you are it's just a bunch of cells forming a little, tiny, microscopic, and certainly beautiful butthole. <laughs> so what is fascinating for me here is that cephalopods and us, well, we evolved complex structures and behavior independently from each other, convergent evolution. And to me, even five years after starting working with, those, with these animals, I still find this fact completely mind-blowing. But you know, cephalopods also evolved novel and divergent traits. In fact, cephalopods have three hearts and blue blood. They also have nine brains and chemosensitive arms, which means that they can taste what they touch, an ability that in certain circumstances I am very happy to not possess. <laughs> and <clears throat> on top of this, cephalopods can also squirt ink as a defense mechanism. They can also regenerate limbs, and they have a super scary parrot-like beak. Little bonus fact just for you about cephalopod reproduction. They have an arm, which is also their penis. 
Think about it next time, just like me, you meet a very friendly octopus who really insists in shaking your hand. <laughs> so, you would agree with me so far that cephalopods are already incredible creatures. But what makes them even more special is their camouflage abilities. In fact, cephalopods can change 3D texture and color of their skin in a fraction of a second to blend in with their environment. Camouflage at its finest. But let's talk about camouflage for just one second. You know how in science we really like to use fancy n names for things that already have a normal name? Probably in an attempt to sound smarter and compensate for a certain lack of self-esteem. Well, instead of camouflage in biology, we really like to use the term Crypsis. So what is Crypsis then? Because when I take my phone and I write Crypsis, the autocorrector changes it to crispy. And very ironically, a good crispy squid <laughs> has not been a very good cryptic squid. So what is Crypsis? Well, avoiding being detected or located, that's what we call Crypsis. But it's not simply hiding, though. There is a nuance, which is about fooling the other animal senses. A rabbit that has the same coloration as snow is being cryptic, because to the eye of the predator, well, it is undistinguishable from its background. But the rabbit is there. A rabbit that is hiding in its burrow, well, it cannot be detected because it is not there. And this, but it is there, that is the nuance which makes crypsis, not hiding. Crypsis is essentially a magic trick. And for every way an animal can perceive the presence of another, you can, imagine, you can imagine a counter, ah, you can imagine a cryptic ability to counteract this detection. For example, rodents have very sensitive ears, so owls evolved silent flight structures. But as owls became more and more silent over evolution, rodents also had to evolve more and more sensitive ears. And this is a loop, a self-perpetuating coevolution, which gave rise to incredible cryptic adaptations, including cephalopod camouflage. So how, 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 how do these animals do this? Well, if you zoom on the skin of a cephalopod, you'll see a lot of little organs that we call chromatophores. Those organs are composed of a little pigment sac at its center and a lot of radial muscles around it. When the muscles contract, the sac expands. When the muscles relax, the sac contracts. So this is very simple in principle, but the thing, is that the skin of a cephalopod can contain millions of those chromatophores. They can have different colors, and together they form patterns, just like pixels on a screen. Cephalopods use this biological display to become invisible. And the way it works is it, kind of like this. A cephalopod just hanging out, you know, in its environment, and through its eyes, it collects visual clues around it. This information is then processed in the brain and guides the animal towards the best cryptic skin pattern. And in this pipeline from input to output, the part that I am the most interested about is how the brain communicates to the skin. So if we zoom again on the chromatophore, you see that those muscles I just talked about are connected to nerves, which links them directly to the brain. So there is no extra mediator between the brain and the output behavior. This makes the system extremely fast. Picture the speed at which my fingers move after I send the signal to do it. Well, it is at similar speed at which cephalopods can change body color. And because of how this system is structured, you can look at the skin of a cephalopod, this array of chromatophores, and their activity as a direct readout of brain signals. So my lab has developed tools and techniques to recognize chromatophores on video, and for each one of those, statistically quantify their contraction and expansion. What you end up with is essentially a natural electroencephalogram. And this is so fascinating to me, because it's like cephalopods are inviting us to read into their minds through their skin. It's like nature is offering us this very unique and non-invasive way of getting a glimpse into how these animals perceive and process the world around them, and to a certain extent, how they feel and what they think. In fact, cephalopods do not only use those chromatophores for crypsis, 
they also use it for communication. And if you're lucky enough, you can also observe those skin patterns in animals that are in a sleep-like state. It would not be too crazy at this point to speculate that this animal could dream, and that what we are seeing are just reflections of inner and deeper experience. So yeah, for me, it is very important to connect with these animals, to study them for a bunch of reasons. Cephalopods are the most intelligent animals. They are also the furthest away in a tree of life. Between us, there is a huge evolutionary trench. So when we are looking at similarities and dissimilarities between us, what we are really doing is studying those fundamental mechanisms behind the emergence of visual systems, the evolution of complex brains. So when we are studying cephalopods, we are learning a little bit about ourselves. We are learning about where this comes from, how it works, who we are. And you see, when I look at a cephalopod doing camouflage, what I see really is an extraordinary camouflaging cloak, which is also a direct window into their perception of the world. It is a naked extension of their brain, which also makes them invisible. So when cephalopods are camouflaging, they are truly being themselves. They are literally showing their true colors. And among all the lessons that I've learned over the years from cephalopods, this might be the most important one. This direct window into their mind, this deep form of transparency, this intimate vulnerability, it is also what gives them superpowers. And you know, we might not have cephalopod skin, but we can all try to be a bit more like them. So yes, you, and you, and particularly <laughs> you over there. You can all be cephalopods. You can be octopuses, squids, or cuttlefish, whatever you want. All you have to do is just embrace who you are, be transparent, speak your mind, and feel vulnerable. Because just like cephalopods, being your true self is also your superpower. And now that I told you to be yourself, I guess I have also to be myself on stage. Unfortunately for me, <clears throat> maybe unfortunately for you. When I'm being myself, I really like to write cringe songs. <laughs> and I really like to perform them in front of 350 people. <laughs> so here we go. Oop. I'm an octopus too. This is forbidden underwater love. In the darkness of the night, shining bright under my dive light, you look at me with your googly eyes. I fell in love between the tides. Touch my hands and taste my fingers. Under the sand, I wanna linger. You change color and you also change me. Yeah, you change color and you also change me. Come on, kiss me on my cheek. Don't rip up my face, you're scary big. Octopus is the name of a genus. Is this your hand or is this your penis? I fell in love between the tides You're hugging me a bit of tight Don't do the same mistake Falling in love, don't vet a braid I fell in love between the tides You're hugging me a bit of tight Don't do the same mistake Falling in love, don't vet a braid You grab my arms, you grab my face And this is too fast, give me some space Is this ink inside my mouth? This love story's going south Please stop trying to choke me while you're doing this to me I'm not fooled for you You're not good for me I fell in love between the tides You're hiding me a bit of tight Don't do the same mistake Falling in love, don't bear the brain I fell in love between the tides You're hiding me a bit of tight Don't do the same mistake Falling in love, don't bear the brain You change color and you also change me 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 Thank you, Frankfurt.